and I will um, turn it over to Kay. Good morning, Kay. Good morning. Well, it is really nice to be back with people who have been with us before. And as Michelle was saying, if you missed one of the two earlier sessions, she's going to have the recordings available and the slides available. Um, so hopefully uh, that will work well for you. Uh, I'm in Portland, Oregon, and it is beautiful here. So I just couldn't resist actually putting a slide in to spend a moment thinking about just what a magnificent day it is. It is, and we have a big topic. And this topic will be a lot more interesting if you will chat in questions or observations, things that you've been doing in your organization. Um, because I, this is, I hope, thought provoking. That's what I'm after is to just uh, open up some ideas about ways that you might rethink your controls and especially think about what you've learned during this period where a lot of us have been operating at least partially remotely and what the control challenges have been in that environment. And also I find that sometimes um, in domestic violence and sexual assault, we're so busy delivering the services and we're so constrained on spending money on anything that could be called a management cost that we sort of stop looking around for new tools that could actually make the work easier, more effective and have better controls. We just feel like, well, what's the point of looking? We can't afford anything. And one of the outcomes I'm hoping for today is that actually you may hear about some things that are not gonna cost a lot of money, but could make a big difference if you could um, free up a little bit of time to think about them. So with that, uh, it always helps me to understand who's in the group. Um, so Michelle's going to put the poll up and I'm going to get a sense of what our composition is today. Um, oh, I think we left the executive director. There, there's, there's the executive director. I see them now. Um, you know, often in nonprofits, people tend to think of, oh, that internal control topic, that's a topic for the fiscal staff. But in fact, what we're going to be talking about today is that it, it has to go beyond the fiscal office or your controls are not going to be effective and they're going to create problems for the organization. So I'm really glad we have some executive directors and program managers with us uh, because I think that you can help us spread the word that while the fiscal director, CFO, they might have had some training in internal controls and they certainly have the big interface with the auditors, um, they cannot do this alone. And so um, if you can help others in your organization kind of come to that understanding and give them a hand, that would be great. So with that, thank you very much for answering and I'm gonna keep going and uh, we'll move on to, well, what are we gonna talk about um, in this session? There we go. Uh, so a whole lot, the theme in my mind is about changing expectations, that there really are changing expectations about internal controls in nonprofit organizations. And of course, there's huge changes in expectations, and I would add affordability of technology. And these two topics really do interrelate. And I think the way that we, many of us got that sort of like front and center in our minds was when we had to quickly go to remote operation and possibly do some things remotely using technology that we had previously used sort of old fashioned paper controls and old fashioned ways of doing. So a lot of us made the change, but we didn't really have time to think about the control implications. And so this is a chance to sort of step back and say, well, if we're going to continue with remote operation, operation? What are some of the controls we should think about? And even if we're not going to continue with remote operation, what are some of the newer approaches that might be more cost effective for us in terms of getting the job done and achieving good controls? Um, so we're going to talk about a number of tech tools in just in the whole fiscal function, but also the relationship between the fiscal function and fundraising and your HR management 
management function, your volunteer management, your service delivery, your marketing, and the big one that isn't listed explicitly but underlies all of these is compliance because I know a lot of us are getting a substantial portion of our funding, um, either through the state or through federal money flowing through the state. And that's where we have some pretty enormous compliance requirements that we really have to think about controls in relation to. And so hopefully by the time we get to the next step slide, um, you will have some ideas that you want to explore. And just like in the other two webinars, it's fine to chat in questions or comments, um, you may disagree with me. You know, I, I have a, a kind of strong view on this and you may say, no way. Um, and, and I would be interested in that. I think other people would be interested too. So um, please do chat in ideas. And I think like the other two, if, if it turns out it would be easier to just ask to speak on the mic, I think we can work that out. So, but let's do the basics. Okay, what are internal controls? Well, for those of you who are the CFO, fiscal director, you've been hearing about internal controls probably from your independent auditor as long as you can remember. And those of you who are used to reading reports when you've had the single audit or the old A133 audit on federal funds, you're used to reading these reports that talk about your internal controls. Um, so we've all heard about it, but what is it? And, you know, it really is systems, policies, and procedures that we've designed. And why? Um, because we want to prevent, and if we can't prevent, detect quickly errors and so-called irregularities. And, you know, that's not a digestive function. That's about willful, uh, on purpose errors that are made. And we're interested in both. Um, the newer thinking about internal controls really puts the heaviest emphasis on the control environment. So we're no longer so focused on, did you get two signatures on that check? Um, who opened the mail? <laughs> Those procedural things, we've got, we've got a real uh, sort of awakening to the fact that none of that stuff really matters if we haven't established a control environment in which everybody who has any contact with your organization whether they're an employee, whether they're a volunteer, a client, a funder, everyone who comes in contact with the organization, particularly with the organization's leaders, its board members, its executive director, its top managers, they understand that these are people for whom integrity and compliance are just North Star values. And these are people who don't want to cut corners. And so part of what we're gonna be talking about is building that environment and testing that environment. So why are we gonna go through all this anyway? Well, the new focus in internal controls is all about risk management. You know, the type of work we do, any nonprofit, but especially in sexual assault, there's just inherent risk in what we're doing. And you all know a lot more than I do about the risk in serving your clients, but there are also risks in the management of the organization. And we cannot eliminate all risk. I mean, you've already figured that out in service delivery. If you eliminated all risk, you wouldn't meet the needs of the survivors that you're trying to serve. So what we want to do in our controls is manage risk. And that's what it's all about. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce the risk that something improper actually happens. It will happen anyway. There's no perfect control. So it, having tried to reduce the risk, we want to increase the likelihood that errors or wrong acts will be detected quickly. And especially we want to reduce the risk, the chance that an error or a wrong act will go uncorrected. So that's what this is all about in internal controls. But 
Um, there are no perfect controls. I can guarantee you that if you were to establish a system of internal controls that absolutely prevented every wrong act from happening, you couldn't deliver any services at all. You would have spent all your money on those controls and that would be ridiculous. So we always have to think about controls from a cost benefit viewpoint. And when I said that we're in a time of change in thinking about internal controls, there really is an older way of thinking about it and a newer way of thinking about it. And when I talk a little bit about the older way, I just invite you to think about your understanding of controls in your organization and think about how large a role do these things in that older framework play. Now, in the old days, and here I'm talking about probably the 80s for some, 90s, on into a little bit into the, what we're supposed to say, the aughts, um, if we were in a nonprofit organization, we would be very focused on checklists of procedures. Maybe our auditor gave us a checklist of procedures. Sometimes funders gave us a checklist of procedures. And those were things like, well, who signs off on hiring someone and the pay rate? And do you have two signatures on every check? There's just a whole list of things that you were supposed to do, and this was gonna protect you. Um, and, you know, those checklists that you got from auditors, funders, they were developed by people doing risk assessment in the past. It's just that oftentimes the checklist was based on a really outdated risk assessment and often one that was done before uh, computerization, before electronic processing became the norm. And so they really miss the point of where the risk is today and waste a lot of time controlling for risks that don't occur anymore. So if you've got that kind of old style checklist, um, one of the characteristics you'll see that is it's very focused on what's called misappropriation. And that means stealing, that someone is going to steal from your organization. Maybe they are gonna be internal people and they're gonna write checks to themselves and steal money that way. Maybe they're gonna take cash from fundraising events. Or maybe you're worried about people outside the organization stealing from you um, by somehow stealing a check. Um, I, and, you know, they were in your office, they saw blank check stock, but of course, nobody sees blank stick check stock today because it's all produced on computers. But anyhow, this was the idea that they saw a blank check, they took it and they somehow managed to pass that check. So again, very focused on misappropriation, stealing. But in nonprofit organizations, particularly those getting a lot of government funding, an equally big risk is what's called misstatement. And that is that we send in reports to our various funders where we state this is true and accurate and we followed all the rules and we didn't. And this isn't true and accurate. And when we were talking the last time about cost allocation and indirect cost, this is a tremendous area where we have misstatement. We, we say here's a true statement and it isn't. And that's actually for many of us a greater risk that's, than somebody is actually going to steal some cash from us. Um, the other old fashioned thinking um, is that, well, you know, the people who really expose us to risk are those newcomers. We had somebody from a temp agency or we got a new volunteer and we didn't check them out well enough. And this low level person is the person who's gonna expose us to risk. Now, what we know today is actually that's not true, that the biggest risks come from what's happening at the top of the organization, from the CEO, the CFO, the longtime program directors. Now, I know that's hard to hear when you're one of those people, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but that is where the risk lies. So the whole new approach is to say, let's get rid of the checklists as a starting point. Now we're gonna end up with checklists at the end, but we're gonna redesign them by focusing on what our risks are and learning about this COSO framework. Now, COSO is an acronym that is kind of meaningless. It's the Committee on Sponsoring Organizations. It was a coalition of accounting professional organizations, fraud auditors, and government accountants that 
came together back in the 70s and early 80s and said, what can we agree on as a way to deal with internal controls? And then they've been revising and revising and revising. So we're going to just take a quick look at their framework. And as I said earlier, the key thing that they are saying is that it is the control environment that at the end of the day makes the difference in your controls. You still have to document your systems, but we're not just documenting systems to show that we comply with checklists. Our systems have to show what was the risk we were concerned about and what is the procedure or policy that we have put in place to control that risk. The other thing that happened when the COSO framework uh, sort of became the new way is a recognition that this is not an area where you get somebody to write some new fiscal policies and procedures and you put them in the file and that's that and you show them to the auditor and we're all done. That that actually doesn't work and it has a negative effect on controls. That training and access to continuously updated procedures and policies is essential. So the emphasis on training and the emphasis on updating is really strong. And finally, the other thing that's been hard for some of us in the human services to accept is that a key part of having effective controls is that we invest in internal monitoring. The auditor, the independent auditor is not part of our controls. Our controls have to include someone who is going to monitor whether all of the systems and policies and procedures that we have put in place are actually working. Are people doing what we are expecting them to do? And you know, they don't always do what we expect them to do. People make mistakes, people don't understand, and people don't have access to the latest information. So we, the only way you're going to find that out is by actually giving someone the time and the training necessary to do internal monitoring. So this is the COSO framework in just its most basic form. I already talked about the control environment, the risk assessment, which is organization-wide risk assessment. This is not just in the fiscal department. This is an assessment of risks that occur in your insurance. There are risks that occur in your HR management. We've got huge risks there. Um, there are technology risks, the security of your technology, and especially there are risks that occur as you deliver your services both in terms of risk to your clients, the people you're serving, but also risks in terms of compliance with the requirements of your funding sources. So having put a positive control environment in place and done an in-depth current risk assessment, then we design our control activities. What are we going to do about this risk? And having designed those activities, they and they are those procedures that it could be a checklist. But having done that, then the key thing in the framework is to say it's not enough to do it. You've got to communicate about it. And you've got to give people who have responsibility for doing some of these controls the information they need. Now, what do I mean? Well, maybe in your system, you have a program manager and you would say, well, that person is responsible for controlling to be sure that we spend the funds on these funding source agreements in allowable ways and that we don't overexpend. But if we don't give that person financial information that is specific to that program and that award, they can't do it. So we have to match the information and communication to the responsibility that we're giving to people. And number five, there is this monitoring, which is whatever systems, policies, and procedures you've put in place, you need okay. somebody in yeah, you All guys. Right. Yeah, we're going to switch. Into okay, great. And I'm about that. That's why you do that. Thanks for speaking up. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, and let's see, are we switched? We're good. Yeah. Great. Okay, so this monitoring, uh, it, uh, you know, the question I would ask you to ask in your agency is 
who is it that actually monitors to see that we are following all of the policies and procedures and systems that we think we have put in place? Now, often in a fiscal department, we have a review function where one person is supposed to review the other person's work. And that's a start to monitoring. But monitoring takes a deeper look and takes a holistic look at what were the requirements of this particular funding source what were the systems and controls we put in place to meet those requirements. Now I'm going to systematically test to see if those controls work, to see if we actually did what we said we were going to do. Now, you know, you can't watch everything all of the time. There's no, there's no money for that. There's no time for that. And so a lot of this whole discussion of internal control is about prioritizing the risks that you're going to invest in controlling. And so in this chart, we're talking about really two different dynamics that we're interested in as we try to prioritize risk. We're interested in the impact of the risk. In other words, if this thing went wrong, how much damage would it do? Okay, would it hurt us a lot or would it hurt us just a little? That's one uh, axis here on our chart. The other axis is probability. How likely is it that this thing I'm worried about in my risk assessment is actually going to happen? And you can see what we've done here is we've broken things into quadrants. And so in uh, the upper right hand corner, the high risk corner, that's going to be where what I'm worried about, the risk I'm concerned about, has the potential to really hurt us a lot. And it also has a relatively high probability of occurring. And let me give you one example from our session last week. If you are pretty sure that you have a non-compliant approach to cost allocation, it does not meet the requirements of your funding sources. And you're pr pretty sure that where you're really breaking down is on the documentation of how people are spending their time and that's the basis for charging personnel costs to an award. I would say you probably are in that a high risk quadrant. Why? Personnel costs are usually a very large portion of a grant agreement. So we've got a very big exposure. And um, there's actually a fairly high likelihood that you may be doing something wrong if that's what you conclude that your system is non-compliant. So we might want to focus there rather than focusing on something where either the impact would be low or the probability would be low. Um, you know, what's a low impact thing? Well, um, maybe you're worried about an old fashioned petty cash fund where somebody years ago set up an envelope where you put $25 in cash. Um, you know, it's probably pretty low risk compared, yes, somebody could steal from that, there's no doubt about it, but it's not gonna expose the organization to the same kind of risk. Okay, uh, just one more thing I think about this, and then I have a question for you. It, 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 you know, a lot of times when people say, well, they said we should improve our controls, and what's that all about? We're thinking fraud, we're thinking misappropriation, that somehow, somehow somebody is going to take something from our organization or misuse some of our assets. And that's what we've got to control against. But actually, we need to pay probably more attention to misuse statement that we are actually claiming that we are complying when we are not reporting financial information that is not accurate according to the guidelines of our funding sources. And corruption, um, you know, I, I used to say, well, we don't see this so much in nonprofits, but actually now I've had some experiences with organizations where they did end up with corruption as a type of fraud, um, basically uh, by often people who've been with the organization for a long time in a high position of authority, becoming confused about what actually benefits the organization and what benefits them. And so they end up um, not putting the organization of the, the, 
the organization's best interest first in making decisions. And I've got a lot of horror stories, but there's no time to tell them to you. So now we've got another poll, and this is to ask you what your understanding is of which frauds, remember we've got, uh, we've got those three types of frauds, we've got the misappropriation, that's the theft, we've got the misstatement, we've got corruption, um, and so far we've got everybody expecting that our biggest exposure uh, for actual money being stolen would come from the top managers and and let's see if we get anybody who um, would be tempted by uh, the idea that because we're all dedicated to the mission, we really don't have any risk of theft in our organization. And I suspect that you've been to sessions where people say that trust is not a control, and that is true. Um, that. Um, really what we want to do about trust is respect people who we trust and put controls in place that will protect them from false accusations. So that's the relationship there. Okay, well, we've got some responses in and I would say that most of you have been reading the fraud literature and indeed um, the greatest dollar losses are coming from um, improper acts by top executives and managers. Why, why is that true? Because they can override the controls that we've put in place. And so a lot of what you do in a risk assessment is ask the question, what can we do to, if we can't prevent it, to detect that our top managers are overriding our controls. And I'll give you just one example to illustrate that so you know what I'm talking about. Most of us have a policy that says, if we issue a credit card to an employee to use for the corporation's purposes, we expect them to turn in to provide receipts for everything that they purchased on the credit card. And most of us have a process in place where someone is responsible for comparing those receipts to the charges on each credit card. Um, and we often have a policy that says, you know, if you don't turn in your receipts on time, you're going to lose your credit card privileges. But what happens all too often is the executive director does not comply with that policy. The executive director says, I'm just too busy to get that report done. I've got to get this grant in and I, I can't do it. I'll do it next month. And we have an accountant or a fiscal director who says, but it's really important, it's a control. And the executive director says, no, I've made a decision. Getting this grant in is more important. Okay, that is an example of overriding a control. What is the protection we can put in for overriding that control? We can have a requirement that a board member reviews the executive director's credit card receipts and reports every month. So at least we have the oversight of the board being aware that the executive director is circumventing a control. So if you recognize the risk, you can come up with a way to deal with it. And I think I see a tech problem there. I, you're saying I'm cutting in and out. Michelle, should I do something differently? Does it seem to you like it's cutting in and out? It is not on, on my end. Okay, so, so maybe that's, that's just a problem with someone yeah. saying, okay, I won't worry about it then. Sure. Okay, because we're kind of shifting gears now from the basic control stuff to saying, well, what are we going to do about it in terms of the use of newer technology to actually help us improve our internal controls? And when I think about the, the newer technology that we're going to be talking about, I think it has tremendous value to reduce the risk of misstatement that our financial reports, our compliance reports might be erroneous, as well as giving us some additional controls for the misappropriation, the actual theft. 
Uh, one of the great things that happens as we begin using these more modern electric tool, electronic tools is that we stop having the potential for error by entering the same piece of information multiple times into the system. Every time a human enters data, there is the potential for error to occur. If we can get it down to one major entry of data and have that information spread throughout the system and then focus on controls to make sure that it was done correctly that one time, it, we, we have uh, fewer whack-a-mole points to, to try to control. Uh, now, I think a lot of us has, have known for years that in order for our systems to be reliable, we have to reconcile the different components of the systems to make sure they agree with each other. Now, what's the most common example of this? Well, in my experience with organizations that are doing a lot of individual fundraising and are using some form of fund development software, whether you're using Greenlight or Razor's Edge, whatever you've got that is a fund development software program, and you're using that for the purpose of donor tracking and donor cultivation, it has major purposes to it. Um, and the people who are usually keeping that system up are people in the fund development arena. We know that we have to do regular reconciliation of the information that's in that fund development system with the information that is in our accounting system. If we don't do that by the time we get to the end of the year, there are going to be discrepancies between what our fund development system says is the total amount of contributions that we generated and what our accounting system says about it. So we know we should reconcile, but very often nobody has time to do it. We try doing it once, it doesn't work out, it's just so frustrating. Um, we get frustrated with each other. In the integrated systems that we're going to be talking about, there are tools that are going to streamline that reconciliation. And same thing on payroll and HR. Maybe we have somebody who's responsible for onboarding new employees and getting all their insurance information, and all their contact information, and getting the authorization for their pay rate. And then we have to convey that information to payroll and to whoever's paying the, the, the payables, the health insurance bill. Um, potential for error is great. And we now have systems that use electronic integration that can reduce that error. Um, now, the other thing that I'm particularly interested in, because you know from last time, I am concerned about whether we are getting employees to really buy in to doing this time tracking that is necessary for um, meeting compliance requirements. And the thing that I've observed again and again is that the more we can move our expectations that someone is supposed to track their time onto some smart device, their phone, their tablet, the more buy-in we're going to have as opposed to asking them to fill out papers or even use a spreadsheet that the accounting department has put together and they just need to fill in the boxes on the spreadsheet. There's still a lot of resistance to doing that at a computer workstation that evaporates when we use some of the newer tools for time tracking on their phones or on their tablets. Um, now, obviously, all of this stuff puts more pressure on having sound IT systems and really skilled people continuously looking at your data security. So while it's improved a lot of the control functions and made a lot of things easier to do, it's added a new level of expertise that we have to have available to the organization because each one of these devices, each one of these smart devices exposes us to new risks. So when we're thinking about using technology to both get our work done and to improve our control. Okay, we're going to do an interpreter switch. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we're, we're dealing with changing expectations around technology as well as around controls. And, and, you know, some of you have been around a long time and others are probably new to the system and you're probably looking at stuff that you're finding in some of our organizations and saying, this stuff is relics. What are these people doing with this old technology? But 
the older approach to technology has been, well, you, you know, you need fund development software, you go, go buy Greenlight, go buy Razor's Edge, you buy a program, you purchase it, and it's a big investment in some cases, and then you have to keep paying for annual updates and for technical assistance when you want to change reports. Um, and you are actually responsible for managing that you got those updates, you got them loaded, you're protecting your servers, you've got security. And really, we're going to do data input manually into each one of these separate systems so that we have fed it the information that it needs. And often these systems were characterized by some predefined reports. And when we got into systems that claimed that they had more flexibility and you could define your own reports, we quickly learned that, yeah, you can, but you've got to have a lot more training and expertise to be effective with that. And sometimes your lack Lack of training and expertise is going to mean that the reports are not reliable. So that's the old day. Now, the newer day is, of course, the era of software as service, where even if you want to buy programs and own them and stop paying for them every year, you probably can't because more and more of what is available to us can only be bought through an annual or monthly service fee. But the great thing is that um, these are web-based programs that give you access from any smart device and the company providing them is responsible for keeping them updated and keeping them secured and doing a lot of the things that we were supposed to be doing. And the piece that is most interesting is that as this technology is evolving, more of them are providing a really smooth automated interface so that um, the possibility of entering the same piece of information into two or three different programs and having errors made in that data entry and then having to unravel those errors, it's, it's really being minimized by the information being transferred electronically. So we're going to talk a little bit about ERP and CRM systems, which are really where we get these platforms that integrate the applications. And the other thing that you know, the great benefit is we now have continuous access to our data. So, and this is mostly good. It can be bad. Those of us who are accountants are not so keen about having people digging into the accounting system to look things up before we've been able to complete the month end process and really get the data updated in there. But those, those are control problems that are solvable. So, um, of course, anytime we're talking to nonprofits about investing in technology, cost is a huge factor. And we're constantly doing cost benefit of analysis of can I afford to make any change or do we just need to live with what we've got? And uh, it is true that if you start thinking about some of these newer tools that we're going to talk about, um, there is a cost involved in even thinking about them. You're going to have to do needs assessment. What are we trying to do here? Selection, which product would be best? We may have to go through a procurement process if, if we've got funding that requires, and we talked a little bit about procurement, the first time requires us to get multiple quotes. Um, so there's going to be a cost in thinking about it. There's also going to be a cost in getting these tools set up properly. We're going to probably have to work with consultants to set them up right. Um, we're going to have to train our staff to use them. Um, and we're going to keep paying the, the software service use fees. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, but I think often people read that or think about that and they think, well, we just we don't have any spare money for that. Um, but then they fail to take a look at what it costs to keep the systems that you have. And the truth is, you may have to have more hours of labor to get the work done in your old fashioned systems than you will after this. And labor is a very major cost. Um, you do still have to update your old stuff and pay those support fees. You probably do not have the same level of access, the flexible 
of level of access as you get on some of these um, integrated platforms. And you're still responsible for doing most of the updates and fixes and server maintenance. So I think what we're seeing is people have pretty much made the decision to move to the web. It's just been uneven in the implementation. So I want to talk just a little bit about two kinds of integrated systems that you may be looking at or may have already implemented. Um, and, and you read about them as the ERP and the CRM. Well, ERP is Enterprise Resource Planning. It's a software as service model. It's web-based. And what it's going to do for you is it's going to gather and organize data and collect it, that has been collected and produced through multiple applications. So it's going to integrate your budget preparation, your accounting, your human resources, your donor tracking, if you have volunteer tracking, and all your other key business functions so that they can all access information from each other. And some of the big names there are listed on these. And, you know, QuickBooks itself does consider that it is doing some of this. And so that's something that QuickBooks users have to think about whether what QuickBooks can do is adequate for what you want to do. Now, um, the other sort of variation of this same idea is the CRM idea, the customer relationship management. It, it's still software as service, it's still web-based, it does this extracting data from multiple databases. It's just that its focus is on customer relationships, which for us includes donors. It has that same feature of eliminating the duplicate data entry and um, you know some of the bigger names in this CRM are Salesforce, which of course is a, a, an open source tool, but we have to build our uh, application and that usually involves some consultant work and, and some fees and nothing, nothing is really free. Okay. And these systems, if that sounded like it's, didn't she say the same thing twice? Sort of, uh, except they have different focal points, okay? And I would say the ERP systems are, are less focused on customer relations, uh, but they're, they're becoming increasingly similar actually as each wants access to the market. Um, so um, QuickBooks Enterprise does consider itself to be an ERP in that it has integrated multiple accounting and budgeting functions with certain other functions. So it may be worth taking a look and thinking about that. I think some of the other players in this probably offer more, but they are more expensive and more complex to set up. Before, um, you know, we're not doing software selection here, so we're not going to go through a big comparison of them. Uh, but what I do want to talk about is using this newer technology to streamline all of these fiscal functions, because we're all doing all of these things. And the question is, are we doing it in an integrated way that minimizes the number of times someone has to put the core piece of information into one system or another and maximizes the degree to which we can put it in once and then use it for multiple purposes. That, that's really the direction we're moving. And so um, some of the areas where we're seeing this automation happen is in cash disbursements and accounts payable. A lot of good stuff happening in expense recording and reimbursement. So if you actually have people who are traveling using credit cards um, or using credit cards for client services, which some of my clients do, and, and you know, you can just really have a time consuming micro matching process. And now we can step away from that. Um, same thing with credit and debit card management. And we've got new tools that make it much easier for us to maintain the level of documentation that we need on purchases that were made with the cards. Um, and I saw uh, Madison pop up and so we're about to switch. Um, 
a lot of stuff happening on cash receipts, on budgeting, on these timesheets and time tracking. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about internal and external audit. So, you know, what am I talking about here? Well, the idea is that we're going to initiate a transaction. We're, we're buying something and we're going to put that initial transaction that we decided to purchase this item from this vendor into our system. And the system is going to provide for an alert to the person who has to approve this purchase um, electronically. They're going to get a message that says there's something for you to approve. They're going to approve it. And once they do approve it, their approval is going to trigger the process of preparing a check if we're doing it by check, or we may be using ACH, electronic payments. So, you know, we don't want to make either checks or electronic electronic payments without approval ahead of time. But now we've automated that cycle from the person who put the initial piece of information into the system to the person who reviewed it, to the actual preparation of the check, and then the actual authorization. You know, there's both, okay, you're authorized to set up that ACH transfer or to prepare that check. But now that that has been done, somebody has to authorize execution. Yes, that check, that check was prepared correctly. That um, direction in the ACH system was given correctly. I approve, we're gonna execute. And once that execution is done, we're automatically recording this in the general ledger with no, that's the major accounting record, uh, with no further um, entry of data. So we've streamlined a process and now the final step that many of us have taken during our remote operations is to say, and let's make sure that that initial invoice that led us to initiate this transaction is stored electronically as well. And many of the systems that we're using now include that ability to scan and actually read from the scan the invoice that we are paying. And so even if you're not using a system that can read from the scan yet, so we still have somebody keying in the initial information, the scan then can be filed electronically so that we have completed this whole process with really just one initiation step. So that's what we're interested in. And, and that was just an example of cash disbursements, but this kind of integrated processing now goes for all of these functions and has that same potential to avoid error, improve control, streamline processing, and streamline the documentation that's needed to review for our internal monitoring. So we're going to talk about some of the specifics here, but before we get too deep into that, um, we're going to have to say, you know, it all sounds great, but it has risks. And um, one of the risks is that if you um, make errors in the initial initiation of a transaction, they're just going to ripple through this whole thing. And so we really have to pay attention to our controls and we really have to differentiate the roles that different people in our organization are going to pay, play in terms of initiation, review, authorization, and then monitoring. And so, you know, that's what passwords are for. And so the systems that we need to use have layered passwords, not one password. It's not like the old days when we you know, had one password to get into the accounting system and somebody stuck it on a stick, sticky above the screen of the accountant and anybody who wanted in would just use that password. We're not, we're not there anymore. We need unique passwords and we need all of our technology to provide layered access. So that certain people can only do certain things. Um, and central to all of this being safe is that whatever systems we're using have to maintain a complete record of who accessed the system and 
when they made a change and if possible, actually a tracker of what change they made. Because if we're gonna rely on these systems to move data through electronically, we have to be able to see who intercepted that data and made a change in it to be sure that they were authorized and that they didn't create an error. And final thing, and when we start talking about ACH, um, the electronic payment of bills, this concept of, no, it's not just a mechanical function that somebody codes it in and the bank sends the payments. The review and approval has to be absolutely as strong as the review and approval that we're used to having on checks. Just, it's just different, it's, but it's no less an approval process. So, okay, I'm always curious what people are um, using and have actually uh, been able to implement. And these are some of the common cash disbursement tools. Um, it, we've got positive pay, right? Um, that's the one where you tell the bank when you complete a run of checks that you're paying your bills with and you, you send an electronic message to the bank that tells them, we just issued checks 100 through 125 and here's the amount and the payee of each of those checks. And if it's not on your list, the bank will refuse to process the check until they can contact you and get authorization. Um, very effective control. It's a little bit expensive unless you can get your bank to realize that you are actually a good customer and they could give you a better price bank break, even though you are a smaller organization. I'm always interested in how many of us have moved heavily to ACH. Now, I, I know the answer to that question. If I'm talking to people individually, um, I would say most people now pay a number of their personal bills through um, electronic payment, uh, which this ACH stands for automated clearinghouse. And it's the term that the banks developed when this was first authorized. So uh, many of us are doing this as a primary way of paying our personal bills. We've been a little slower to adopt it for our organization's bills, but I think we're increasingly realizing, and this was so true during the, the worst of the COVID period, is that we can move things a lot faster if we start doing this electronic processing and not cutting checks and chasing down somebody to sign the check. We do that electronically, but we've got to have the systems in place that give us the controls to do that. I am seeing smaller nonprofits go for full on outsourced AP. And these are systems where we don't wanna write any checks. We don't wanna initiate any uh, electronic funds transfer, ACH transactions. We just wanna be able to scan our, the invoices that come to us where somebody says we should pay them. We wanna scan it into a system where an outsourced business is going to produce the payments based on our authorization and review. And if you've looked at systems like bill.com or QuickBooks has its own version of this, um, that is the, the core concept of outsourced AP, although those systems can be used internally too, but we now have businesses using systems like that to pay all your bills for you. Um, that's a cost benefit question of how big do you have to be for that to be a cost saving as opposed to being more trouble than it's worth. Many of us have been using debit and credit cards to make purchases for some time. Um, there are there's some new technology that can streamline the processing of that and put some controls in place. Some of us use purchase cards. I'm not a huge fan of purchase cards, but they do work. Um, so we talked about positive pay talked about ACH. Um, and uh, the one thing I really like about ACH in a nonprofit environment is your ability to control which vendors can be paid and put blocks on either all ACH, if you don't want to do it at all, or blocks on specific types of payments. So this can give you an electronic control that reinforces or maybe is more effective than the human control of, no, I don't think we should pay that bill. Um, okay, and that's about the outsourced um, AP. 
And now I want to talk about using credit cards for purchasing. And, you know, we got to remember the basics that if your nonprofit obtains the credit card, then your nonprofit is liable to the issuer. So you sign an agreement, you have to pay what is charged to that card. Almost all the systems now require that you put the name of a specific user on each card. So each of your staff members who are given a credit card have their name appear on the card and a separate statement is prepared for the charges on that card. Um, this has great advantage in that you can set different credit limits for different users, depending on what their function in the organization is. So if you have, for example, an executive director who needs to do a lot of travel to conferences and may need a fairly high limit to handle some of that, fine, you give them that limit. And you may have somebody whose purchases are really quite minor for supplies for certain types type of program, and we can put a low limit on theirs. Um, I think, you know, the basics of having a credit card system that works is a clear written agreement with each person who's going to have a credit card about their responsibility for any improper charges that are made on that card. And that is really important because, um, you know, a lot of us will say that we have to have a system that says, you know, one strike or two strikes and you're out. In other words, if you misuse your credit card, if you allow improper charges to be made on that card, um, we'll give you one time to learn a lesson, two times for a warning and three times you can't have a credit card anymore. It has to, this is that control environment where we're very serious about no improper charges on a credit card. So zero tolerance for misuse. Um, now there are red flags and unfortunately I, I come into organizations after they've had credit card problems and it's, it's painful to see the red flags that were ignored. Um, and one of the biggest red flags is, well, there's a lot of people that need to do purchasing from the internet. So Mary, our office manager has a credit card that has a high limit because sometimes we purchase tablets or other expensive items. And she keeps that credit card in her desk drawer or she shares that credit card number and information with anybody who needs to make a purchase. That totally defeats the controls that we've put in place. And we have really a very hard time holding Mary accountable for all the purchases that were made on her credit card when we directed her to let other people use that card. Another common problem is having agreed to just have one limit on all the cards. It's very rare when everybody who has a card needs the same limit. Tolerating delayed submission of the backup. And that's where some of the new technology is really gonna help us because we're gonna be able to allow people to use um, their cell phones to send in the receipts that they're getting as they use the card. So there's no possibility of, oh, I just stuff it in an envelope and I'll get to it when I get to it. We're gonna have it automatically come through. Um, and you know this is an old one, but I still see it happening that people are accepting the credit card slip that says, um, okay, this person bought $100 worth of merchandise at a, a Fred Meyers or a Costco, and it doesn't include a listing of what was purchased. So we have no way of knowing whether they were purchasing things for their personal use or for the nonprofit's use. So accepting the charge slip rather than the detailed itemized um, receipt, a common red flag. And we already talked about the problem of executives who are too busy to get this information submitted. Debit cards, uh, you know, do directly draw from your bank account. They have fewer legal protections. If you're going to use debit cards, um, you, you're going to have to have an absolute prohibition of using the cards for the withdrawal of cash. And most banks will allow you to set up that provision electronically so they cannot be used to take cash out. 
got to hold the cardholder responsible. You want to set low daily maximums on this. Uh, and because uh, really, if you're doing large purchasing, I would say, what about a credit card? Um, Purchase cards, I'm not going to really spend much time on. Uh, the thing I'm interested in, in terms of controls and technology, is what's available now to streamline the review of credit card purchases. Because I think we are using credit cards more. It, it just um, is easier, and we're doing a lot of online purchasing. So what we want are these expense tracker applications. And the big ones down there that are listed at Expensify, Zoho, Nexona, Baby, but there's tons of these. And they all have the common purpose of creating a way to capture Sure, the detailed receipt and code it and transmit it electronically. And because that's how the information is coming in to the person who's supposed to reconcile the credit card and to the statement they get from the credit card company, they're not dealing with a bunch of scraps of paper. They've got an electronic record that they can set up. And most of the systems have an automatic comparison of all the information that has come in through this scanning and coding to the information coming from the credit card company and flagging the ones that don't match. And it looks like we're about to switch interpreters. So, um, and what's really useful about these systems is that they're going to provide automated alerts for what's missing so that we can um, just share that alert with the credit card holder and say, you know, where is it? And you need to get it in. All right, I'm, I'm going to stop talking about credit cards and now talk about the other side of this money coming in. And um, this is where uh, hopefully you have uh, gotten into the use of remote capture devices. If you are, um, if you're still doing campaigns where people, you know, there's, there's a remittance advice card in your paper appeal that you sent out. I mean, this is kind of old fashioned, but some of us still find it works. So we've sent somebody a, a written snail mail appeal. It's got a remittance card that says, you know, send this in with your contribution. And we've got, you know, we've been lectured that we should have uh, two people open the mail. So they're sure we're sure we don't lose any of these checks that have been sent in the mail. Um, and the whole thing is going to be speeded up enormously if we are using a remote capture device. And this is the gizmo that they have in supermarkets and <laughs> everywhere now, where you just feed the checks into what is a scanner that is going to transmit directly to your bank account, giving you the beauty of instant depositing in your bank account rather than waiting till somebody has time to take a deposit to the bank. Um, and if I do have managed to get two people to sit there for the time it takes to open the mail, there's not a whole lot of detailed data entry that they're doing. They're simply agreeing with each other. How many checks did we get? And they're putting them through the scanner and they're looking at the report that the scanner produces and going through and checking off that. Yeah, that's all the checks we put in there and they both sign off and we've got a great record um, that we have developed deposited all the checks that came in. And of course, what's even better in the good remote capture systems is that some of them permit the electronic transfer of that image from the check into our fund development software. And some of them have the capacity to read the electronic information so that we don't have someone doing laborious data entry. Even if we still need to have someone do the data entry, they are doing it from the scanned image and they are not taking a stack of checks and running them through a copier. And we know that one of our big control risks is that modern copiers have computer chips inside them and they retain a record of what they have copied. And what we don't want is for anyone to have access to the routing information of our donors' checks. And this is, you know, the beauty of remote capture is the instant deposit. You need a policy on when you're going to destroy those checks because what we don't want is those checks lying around somewhere where someone could take them and use that donor um, 
bank routing information improperly. They got a lot of information, particularly sometimes there's additional information on the remittance advice. Um, but of course, it's kind of old fashioned to be getting uh, a lot of payments in the mail. What's much more likely is that we're appealing to people electronically and we're driving them to our website where we've got the donate now button and we've got a payment processor that is handling all those electronic payments. Um, so we, we know that that is an effective way to raise money and it is also a potentially highly effective control because we have this independent body that is tracking and reporting to us electronically on all the payments that they have processed for us. And once we have that data electronically, it can be uh, transferred into our accounting system without the potential for data er entry error. Now, of course, many of us are finding that uh, electronic funds transfers, this is where a donor authorizes us to take money out of their bank account. Many of us are preferring this method for recurring contributions. And if you watch public TV, you know that they are heavy into getting you to stop giving every month on your credit card and start giving every month by electronic funds transfer from your bank account. Um, so it it is a certainly it's a good a tool for fundraising, but it's also a helpful tool for improving our controls because those payments come into our system electronically. And so we're not doing data entry. Again, the possibility for error. And I've got one more of these things I just want to say a little bit about. Okay, and I just see an interesting question here. How do you convince staff that you trust them and are not being oppressive while at the same time ensuring controls and compliance? I think that's a great question. So I wanna pause in the middle here and answer that question. I think that it is helpful to present the whole concept of controls in, in two ways of framing it. One is, there, we value our staff and we want to protect you. And we want to be sure that you would never face a false accusation or a suspicion that you had done something wrong when that is the last thing on earth that you would ever do. And so particularly for executive directors, but also for just the most entry level and employee. I want them to understand that the reason I'm investing in these controls is so that we have constant evidence that they did the right thing. And so that any allegation, any, any sense or feeling that they did something wrong or improper, we have the evidence that that is not true. And we are prepared to defend them and to um, calm fears. So sometimes for people, they haven't looked at it that way. They've looked at it. You don't trust me. You think I'm going to do something wrong. And my response is, no, I think you're going to do something right. And I guess I can speak with a lot of passion on this because I've worked with people people who've been falsely accused in nonprofits. And it's a terrible thing. It destroys relationships when that happens. And so knowing that you have the controls that can document that someone did the right thing is what we owe them, uh, rather than saying, no, we're, we're just going to be kind of sloppy here and we'll trust everybody. Um, that, that is really unfair to people. And the other thing is that I talk to people about the fact that this is not all about theft. We are not obsessed with thinking that people are going to steal from us. We are in a heavy duty compliance environment. Our funding comes from the government. If we end up failing the compliance tests on these funds, we run the risk of not just losing that award, but losing other awards because our past non-compliance impacts our ability to be funded. And so we all have a stake in being sure that our systems will ensure compliance so that we as an organization don't risk our funding that we need to serve the people we're trying to serve. 
Um, so sometimes that helps. Sometimes people are still going to feel it. But one of the things that I think when I hear a lot of that resistance of you don't trust me, often it's because they know that at the same time that I'm telling them that we've got a three strike system on credit cards. And if you can't follow the procedures, you're going to lose your credit card. They know the executive director is not turning in their stuff. And of course, they're going to feel like you don't trust me. So that's where the control environment at the top really matters so that people know that the leaders of the organization value the controls as protection for them and observe the controls as protection for them. And that's what I say to executive directors about this idea of having a board member review your credit card statement and receipts. That's not because they don't trust you. That's because they're going to protect you against an allegation that you did something improper. Well, on a different level altogether, I'm, let's see, I, I think we need to pick up a little pace here. I'm looking at my time. Um, this is a little more detail on each of these things that um, we, in, when we use these virtual terminals, we get some controls. Uh, there's a lot of choices on these uh, virtual terminals. So it, it, this, is, this is another example of what I was saying earlier. Changing technology, the process of changing doesn't come free. There's a lot of checking out and comparing. And I've become interested in thinking about, you know, the people doing the work are pretty busy. This might be something that's worth a limited contract with a consultant to come in and look at what are the opportunities for streamlining and improving controls and to actually identify the products and do the cost benefit analysis and present a report with some recommendations. You know, it wouldn't cost that much. And I think it would get done as opposed to just asking people who are too busy already to go shopping. And shopping is kind of a, a low a low priority for a lot of us. Okay, a um, few more things about controls on debit and credit card payments. Got to recognize that if you have people's credit card information, uh, you have to protect that information, and you have to be sure that your controls and your processing makes access to that information basically impossible in by improper uses. And that's that's why these web-based processors are so helpful uh, because they are secured portals. And um, the, I just want you to note that last bullet point on this slide. Yes, they have controls. And yes, it can be a great time saver because of their providing information electronically. Yes, you can shop for favorable fees. But it's not going to work if you haven't looked at where the exposure in your organization may be. And that is in how the processor transfers the funds to your organization's bank account. And then going back to the real basics, who has access to withdraw funds from that account? So this is one of those systems thinking problems. We, we really researched, we got a good web processor, we figured out how to use all the information to flow through our accounting system, but we missed the original control of how do we make sure that we limit access to actually being able to withdraw funds from any account account that funds are transferred into. Now, a lot like, um, you know, I use uh, Stripe on uh, my website and they transfer directly into the bank account that I have directed them to. And so I have the controls on that bank account. I used to use PayPal and PayPal has its own account and you have to activate a transfer from that. So who has access to activating the transfer from PayPal? Because we don't want them to be able to direct that transfer to any place other than the correct place where we have controls. 
Just want to say a few words about a lockbox. Um, this is something that only those of us who have really high volumes of payments coming in, like a huge campaign at one time during the year, might investigate lockbox. Great control has a fee involved. Um, banks are really catching up on the electronic processing. So while you can look at that fee and say, that's a lot of money, if they are going to get all the data you need and it can be electronically transferred into both your development system and your accounting system might be worth it. Now, I want to talk a little bit about budget tools because, you know, you're preparing your budget in an organization with multiple programs and multiple grants can be extremely time consuming. And then the question becomes, so do I have any automatic interface between this spreadsheet based budget tool that I'm using and my accounting system. And I'm just going to pause for a moment because I think we're switching. Um, so this, this becomes more challenging the more different funding sources and the more different programs you have because you have a more complex budget document. And the old way of doing this was to do it all on spreadsheets, produce this beautiful budget, and then have someone in accounting um, do, you know, that's in Excel generally, have them import that into the accounting software. And very frequently, it was cumbersome and error prone to do that. And so I found we had a lot of accounting people who resisted doing it and said, you know, it's just too time consuming because you've done this budgeting on such a micro level. Um, but if I don't put it into the accounting software, then how am I going to get my budget to actual comparisons? Well, there are other ways to get those comparisons, um, basically exporting data out of the accounting system. But there are challenges with that. And you, in, when you use those export systems, you often have your budget information set up in spreadsheets and you just bring the accounting information in error prone. So what we're seeing now is a set of products that handle that totally um, electronically. And the one that I'm most familiar with is Adaptive Insights. Um, there are many other systems out there. And so I'm always looking for people um, who have used one of the integrated budget applications who can make a recommendation to me. You know, some of you are, are probably using MIP accounting software and MIP does have a budget module. And so that, for some people, that is a good solution. Razor's Edge, you know, this, the accounting software is Financial Edge. It has a budget module, but most of my clients just find it sort of hopeless. It's just too complicated to use. Um, QuickBooks has a budget uh, application, but I don't ever find, I, I just feel like it mirrors the QuickBooks problems. It doesn't really help. So I'm always looking for examples here of good integration. But one thing that I think is helpful is improving the formatting of your budget. And I, some of you have heard me recommend this before. This is a free downloadable tool. Um, it allows you to prepare a budget that has multiple programs and sub programs, maybe at multiple locations and also multiple funding sources. And it allows you to change the variables as you get more information. We thought this funding award was gonna be for $100,000, but it turned out was for 120. So I've got to go back through and change everything. This it's linked spreadsheets is what this is, linked worksheets in an Excel file. So I just encourage you to look at it because what you will end up with is the worksheets that ease the, uh, the transfer of data from Excel into these accounting software packages. I'm shifting gears again and um, saying that I, one of the things I've gotten interested in is the newer payroll and fringe benefit tools and HR tools. And I think that by automating 
um, well, first of all, from the accountant's point of view, getting the data from employees where they are tracking their time and distributing their hours into the different cost centers that their hours should be charged to, getting that data electronically and having an automated interface that allows me to have that translated into allocating the actual cost of their salary for that month. That's what I want. I, you know, I know how to do it on a spreadsheet. I know how to download information that that um, staff have provided that would let me allocate their time into percentages and apply that to their wages. What I want to do is to do that automatically without my interaction with the spreadsheet. Um, so uh, I'm interested in how far everybody in this group may have gotten with online timekeeping. I'm also interested in online HR management tools. Um, these are the ones where you're going to be looking not just at um, things like pay rates and establishing benefits, but a lot of other employee data that is going right now into your HR system. Can you get software that integrates that information with your timekeeping and payroll so that it's a completely integrated system that tracks everything we need to know about this employee. And so I'm looking for people to type in some, some things that you're using and that you like. Um, so, you know, the first thing is finding a good time and effort tracking system that people can use. And, you know, some of the large payroll services like ADP and Paychex, they have these. Um, and it, it, what I'm hearing from my clients is that um, the glitch seems to come not with the employee using the online tool on their smart device. That's going well. The glitch happens when the translation is made to try to actually allocate the payroll costs using that information. And that's where people find a lot of hidden charges in using payroll services where they, they sell you on, we can do this, but they fail to tell you that the way you want it done is actually gonna cost extra. So again, this is one where it can really help to use a consultant who has set up these systems to help you figure out what will work for you. Um, okay. Click time. I've had people tell me they kind of like click time, but HR information still in the hard copy files. See, we're not quite there yet in most of the nonprofits I'm working with. We're making progress on the time and effort, but getting that integration with the HR systems is a challenge. So um, this, this slide here, this is where really getting clarity with an outside payroll service provider about what they can do and what they're going to charge you to do it. And the real catch here is what are they going to charge you when you need to make changes? Because you almost certainly will need to make changes during the course of the year. Now, those HR systems that we were talking about, um, what are we talking about? Well, these are, these are often part of ERP systems, um, those enterprise resource planning systems. And what we want is, you know, HR staff people, they know all about the record keeping they have to do to document that they onboarded somebody properly and they got all the information from them and they explained the benefits and they explained about paid time off and they kept a record of how they use their paid time off so that we could always tell someone you have accumulated X hours of paid time off and that record is integrated by the employee. Uh, a lot of us have mandatory training requirements that people have to hit and we've got to have a record of that. Well, these automated systems are going to flag, well, who do we need to remind to get their whether it's a first aid certificate or some other kind of certificate updated. Most of us have systems where we expect um, that we're going to evaluate our employees on a regular cycle. So these are flagging systems to say, hey, you didn't do this employee's evaluation. Um, and of course, there's endless insurance documentation that we have to do. And we have to integrate all of this information with the payroll software. So the question is, um, 
can we get what we want in any integrated format? Now, there's a lot of these systems out there. Zenefits is one that you know advertises a lot um, that will solve your um, yeah, your HR system tracking problems. Um, and I'm still looking for just okay. So it's, somebody's using Abila. Okay, that's good. Yeah, you know, uh, Abila has an interesting history. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to say a whole lot more about donor tracking other than the need for reconciliation. And uh, I hope that you're fully utilizing um, your web tracking information to, to actually improve these systems. This is, this is the control slide. And I'm kind of rushing now because I've got a couple of things I want to be sure we get to. Um, you know, this is its own personal nightmare, trying to get your donor tracking to match up with your general ledger accounting. Um, this is another situation where you've probably, I mean, many groups I work with have had this on their to-do list for three years. Um, they've had problems at the end of the year where they cannot tie out the donation records in the donor tracking system with the accounting system. Auditor says you have to start reconciling regularly. It's on the to-do list. It never gets done. Okay, um, so uh, this is one where sometimes hiring a consultant to figure out how to do that reconciliation is going to save a lot of time. Okay, I'm not going to talk about that. I am going to talk about data security risks, which are enormous, and most of us probably need help on all of this security stuff. And so I think this is an area where if, if you don't have anyone on staff who has expertise, this is definitely worth paying for, not paying for once, but paying for on an ongoing basis so that you are sure you've got your security challenges under control. And this is where I wanted to get, so that's good. Um, you know, one of the problems that people tell me about is they hear about, well, there's a product that does this or a product that does that, but they just, they don't even know where to start looking. And a place that I have found just personally very helpful is at the Intact Marketplace. Now, Intact is a high-end enterprise uh, resource planning tool. It, it's an accounting system, but it's much more than that. And it's probably too high-end for most uh, um, mid-sized nonprofits, larger nonprofits might be a good tool for them, but they have all these partners and the partners are the companies that have made all these web-based applications to do things like time and effort tracking, um, expense account tracking, um, HR management, all of these different web-based applications. Now, the reason they're on this site is those products all integrate with Intact, um, but they also integrate with QuickBooks. They integrate with all kinds of other products. So you don't have to be a, an Intact user to find this really useful because the way they've organized the marketplace is to um, actually group products by what they do and to use kind of common language terms for what they do so that you can go down the left side navigation and say, well, I want to look at a time and effort tracking set of products. You click and you see all these products describing what they do and you can click into their websites. And it's just a great research tool for those of us who don't spend our days looking, shopping for technology. It's also a good tool to hand off to um, a consultant who's going to do some shopping for you because Intact has made such a major thrust into the nonprofit market that many of these tools are very responsive to our nonprofit needs. Now, I also thought it might help to have some other links to um, help think about some of the tools that are available. And I hope you're aware of N10 already. Um, it's a national technology organization focused on the needs of nonprofits. And they are constantly evaluating products and strategies that work to meet nonprofit needs. So um, they, they do these reports from time to time and I find them just really helpful. Um, 
I also have found uh, two commercial vendors, Software Connect and Software Advice, um, to be pretty useful in helping you analyze what it is you're looking for. They charge fees, but I, I think it might be worth some help from them. I'd probably start with N10 first, just because they are nonprofit focused. And that kind of brings us to the end. And I know one of our interpreters is going to have to step out. So thank you. Um, but I'm hoping that as you've been through this session, you've been thinking about well, what are you going to do about it? You spend an hour and a half thinking about this. What are you going to do about it? And um, my hope is that you will think a little bit more about the COSO framework. I can give you more links to COSO. There's a, there's a free publication that you can download. And I realized I didn't get the link in this set of slides. Um, you can also ask your auditor. And you're probably, uh, many auditors, particularly if they're coming from a large firm that is nonprofit focused, they've already switched their approach to internal control to a COSO framework. And they're really asking you questions about those five elements of the COSO framework. But if they haven't, it's still worth your time to think about it because it is a way that will help you stop looking at checklists and start thinking about what's important. Um, I hope you've got some interest in maybe exploring some of the newer tech tools, um, both because you need to operate remotely and because you want to streamline uh, processing and because you want to automate controls. And I also hope that you'll think about the cost benefit analysis that would say, you know, there's a cost in not making any change as well as a cost in thinking about what change to make. Um, so um, I think we made it through at uh, 11 o'clock, just exactly. And um, I don't know, Michelle, can we hang on and see if there's any questions that we should try to answer? Yes, the, um, the caption is gonna be gone, um, but yes, we can of course hang out. Um, for a few minutes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm just sort of interested in the chat um, that Intact is offering a lot of free webinars. Yeah, they, they really have quite an operation. Um, and anything else? Somebody is recommending N10, I recommend N10 totally. Um, by state issues, oh gee, we didn't get there. Um, okay, so now, um, this uh, question of staff being inaccurate in their time recording, that is a big issue. And that's where monitoring matters. Um, that we can tell people what we want them to do, but unless someone is gonna periodically check and question and ask the supervisor and reinforce that what we want is not a mirroring of what it was supposed to be, but a reflection of what it actually is. And I, that's where I think the control environment is so important because if people understand that our goal is compliance and that means telling the truth. And if there's a problem, because sometimes there is a problem when we budgeted for a, a particular funding source, a particular program, we underestimated how much time it was gonna take. And so we said, you should spend 20% of your time. But in fact, when the person is doing the work, it cannot be done in 20% of their time. And so the truth is they're spending 40% of their time. And in a, a positive control environment, that person is going to feel comfortable saying to their supervisor, you know, I know the plan was 20%. It cannot be done in 20%. You need to help me solve this problem because I know that you do not want me lying on my timesheet. And I don't want to lie either. So I think it's that environment that is a key to this. It's still a problem. I mean, I don't want to minimize what a problem it is. And the other thing is, you know, there's been a lot of studies done about how we misperceive the use of our time. And most of us, if asked to recall, like last week, how, what did you do? Most of us will dramatically overstate the amount of time we spent on something we don't like doing. Oh my God, I spent hours doing this report. It was just endless. I must've spent half my time doing it. And we will understate the time we spent doing things we love doing. Like I really had a chance to, um, 
have a deep conversation with my supervisor about how I could improve my performance. If, the, if that was a positive for you, if it was a negative, I'm sure you'll overstate it. But if it was a positive, you might understate it. So what, what's the solution to that daily timekeeping? Because our memories fade. And uh, when you have to get those hours to add up, however many hours you work, that's when accuracy comes in. Okay, we probably need to stop, but I guess there's more new messages there. Should I do something to see those before I just give up? Um, that was 